Welcome back to the Super Day Science Podcast, everybody. Super pumped to have you back here on the show today. We've got a very special guest, Greg Pavlik, calling. I believe you're from uh, the West Coast of the U.S., right, Greg? Yep, yep. We live in the Bay Area, so uh, good place to be for technology, good place to be for machine learning. Fantastic. How long have you been there for? Uh, about 12 years now. 12 years? Yeah. So yeah, we're not really... I long timers we uh we we showed up from the east coast uh, about 12 years back moved from, oh, okay uh, new jersey area what what made you move uh work <laughs> yeah yeah we we were i was flying it got to a point where i flew out um once a month and then it was every two weeks then it was every week um so after about a year of flying out weekly wow uh, we decided it was time to move yeah i think it was 50 out of 52 weeks out of the year i was on the road um, wow. Now, you know, of course, with the pandemic, I don't travel at all. But, um, you know, the, the baseline for travel now is usually what all mostly around the West Coast and mostly once a month. Very interesting. Um, I met one once uh, a gentleman who was flying in, flying out to mining sites also like every week uh, because he was a drag line, like he was a drag line operator, like with those massive machines. And they're very like uh, rare or hard to come by. These people who are really talented. So this mining side was flying him out and out every week for seven years. So yeah, <laughs> when I saw him on the plane, I was I felt a little bit sorry for him because the shape of his back perfectly fit into the seat of the plane. Well, what I found when I was traveling all the time is you get up Monday morning on the six a.m. flight and it's the same people every week, oh. week, week after week. Uh, yeah. They just do a pattern. A lot of consultants. Um, sometimes managers, but it's it's not a good lifestyle if you can yeah. avoid it. I, I definitely recommend something a little bit more stable. Yeah, I got you. And um, uh, do you miss it now with the pandemic that you have to stay at home? Is it something you reminisce? Well, the big issue for me is I don't miss travel, but uh, it's more of the face to face teamwork. I mean, one of the things I've always felt is um, the whiteboard is hard to beat as number one engineering tool. And mm -hmm. I've still not found a great substitute for kind of face-to-face -face conversation in front of a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's just that sort of social capital you build, talking to people when you're really in the same room, you know, sharing a cup of coffee. Um, mm -hmm. Then the other problem is, and I think this is one that people underestimate, the, the value of these sort of ad hoc hallway conversations, uh, especially when, not so much when you're trying to do a technical problem, but when you're trying to work across teams and get teams to coordinate, keep it, people on the same page. There's a lot that happens on, informally, and uh, it's very difficult to do the informal thing when you have to start a Zoom meeting in order to start a conversation. So I think there's mm -hmm. a lot of discussions that just don't happen, or if they do happen, they're sort of you know, email exchanges that can be interpreted in different ways. Um, that, so that, that's, a, that's been a bit of a tax. Um, the flip side is, uh, and this is actually a concern I have, is people seem to be working more hours now more than ever mm. uh, just about a week ago we gave everybody a mandatory day off in the organization mm. and we'll probably do that again uh in another four to six weeks just to kind of let people pace themselves mm. uh, because they, you know this there's this tendency get up in the morning log in start working you know, take a break to get some eat work 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 another break to eat work and then next thing you know your day is over mm. it's great in terms of trying to advance the ball and moving things forward um, up until you start to hit burnout. So we're really trying mm -hmm. to figure out ways to keep people productive, but also make sure they don't, uh, you know, wear themselves out. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely something. Our team is fully remote, so definitely we something we noticed as well. Um, people yeah, we've been, need one, to take one of the things we've been trying to do is start to take um, lessons from companies and organizations that do work fully remote all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um we have some people that have come in through open source communities that we're trying to adopt best practices um, from open source especially from the, uh, the apache software foundation uh in terms of how we do our internal development um that's helping i think improving things from a quality perspective overall but uh learning more from organizations that have been especially companies that have been remote full-time something that we're working on as well mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. it's really important it's not you know, it's not the same. Things go reasonably well, I think, as people adapt. Uh, but uh, as far as like really getting things dialed in and making sure that we're keeping uh, the bar high from a quality perspective, 
uh, from a work-life balance perspective are probably the two biggest challenges we have right now. Mm, absolutely. And coming back a bit to the point you mentioned about uh, the value of those ad hoc conversations in the hallways, it was very interesting to hear that coming from you since uh, you are uh, in charge of um, like a big part of Oracle to do with the cloud. And one of the goals is to move on-premise to the cloud. Uh, question, Can do you think sometime in the future, maybe triggered by this pandemic, maybe just over the course of time, we will be able to come up with a solution, whether it's VR or AR, where we will move those ad hoc um, communication talks to the cloud? For instance, we could all wake up and put on virtual reality goggles and be walking around a virtual office. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, and I, I would certainly say the way things have developed, you know, there's a global search for talent. Um, you can't just go to any one country, any one state and say, hey, this is this is the talent pool we want. Um, so I think that there's a strong potential for more and more organizations to adopt VR for things like uh, international team integration. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're local to an office, though, I think there's just a human element that it's hard to replace. Um, unless unless the VR gets you know, sophisticated enough that you can't uh, distinguish between mm -hmm. <laughs> reality and the virtual environment, I think people are still going to want to have the face to faces. And when, when I was at the last company I was at, our management team was pretty distributed, um, but we made uh, a real point to get together at an offsite every quarter, uh, at least once a quarter, and mm -hmm. uh, you know it was a kind of a interpersonal relationship dynamic that kind of got reset and reestablished mm -hmm. uh, quarterly. And I think those those are hard to replace with current technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think I think we're going to see a lot more um, technology evolution toward facilitating uh, better team dynamics. Right now, you know, the, in some ways, the state of the art seems to be Slack, um, <laughs> which, you know, Slack is great, but it's also, it's kind of a strange kind of interrupt driven technology. It's mm -hmm. not the same thing as you know, I'm walking down the hall, get a cup of coffee and I run into someone. So you're kind of, mm. you're already both out of the zone of work and trying to, um, you know, get something else done that's not quite mm. as pressing as a mm. hardcore problem solving mm. uh, focus. So that kind of thing, I haven't seen a way yet to really replace. Mm. You know, maybe Oracle can build something. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll see. <laughs> Go ahead, chat. I hope you're enjoying this amazing episode. We'll get straight back to it after this super quick announcement. Data Science Go Virtual. Have you registered to attend yet? If not, make sure to check it out, datasciencego.com slash virtual. The dates are coming up June 20th to 21st. It's a weekend. On the Saturday, we've got talks and workshops for newcomers and transitioners. And on the Sunday, we've got uh, talks and workshops for practitioners and managers. So whatever level you are, this is the virtual event for you and it's absolutely free yes it's absolutely free but the number of seats is limited so apply to attend now you can find uh, the event at datasciencego.com virtual come enjoy the talks have lots of fun network with your peers even if you don't manage to get in for whatever reason you will get the recordings afterwards if you register for the event once again the website is datasciencego.com virtual no reason not to attend no reason not to register so make sure to jump on this opportunity only a matter of days left until this happens and i look forward to seeing you there and now let's jump straight back into this amazing episode well uh greg you are um the vp senior vp and cto at oracle cloud platform what I'd love to dig in is to understand your journey. So you've had a very interesting career just by judging by your LinkedIn and uh, you um, spent over, I was counting, over 12 years in Oracle at to in total. So In total, yeah. yeah. Could you walk uh, us through? Accident, to be honest. <laughs> Sorry? I said I wound up here by accident. <laughs> How did that happen? So, you know, my, my, my background is not actually in uh, computer science. Uh, it's, it's really solid state physics and physical chemistry. Oh, wow. Um, and I took a job to develop high temperature ceramics for satellite nose cones back in the 90s uh, and in uh, Colorado. And I showed up at the job and day one, they said, well, you can do this, you know, this uh, ceramics engineering work that you've got, um, you know, prepped up and ready to go. Or we need people to do software development. And with this project where we're building a simulation for a spacecraft, really interesting stuff. 
And I said, well, and, and oh, by the way, we'll pay you more. I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take, I'll take, you know, I said, I'm, I'm willing to take more money, but um, you guys would be willing to put me through a master's in computer science. So they said, yes. And wow, uh, I just kind of shifted, shifted my focus quite a bit. Um, but it was a really great project. Actually, we, we developed, um, basically a simulation, not only the spacecraft, but also the full space environment. Um, mm-hmm. so that when they took the actual command and control, um, uh, hardware and they plugged it into the software simulation, it thought it was controlling a spacecraft. And as the spacecraft was doing things, you know, moving, um, solar panels or firing off re- reaction control thrusters. The simulation was then producing all the dynamics you would expect in the space environment uh, to fully mm. test the thing. So it was it was really really cool project. One of my favorite uh, work projects I've done uh, mm. in my career, um, and uh, that started me down the journey of uh, software, and wound up going uh, through a series of startups. The last one before the first stint at Oracle was a company called Bluestone Software, which was an early app server, kind of in the heyday of um, mm. Uh, the dot com boom and app server mania, and so we we were one of probably four vendors at the time that were kind of pure players on the app server side. Um, the the incumbent that really won the day was BEA Systems with mm-hmm. WebLogic Server, and then they mm-hmm. eventually were acquired by Oracle. So they wound up at Oracle too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when we, when Oracle when um, when the dot com market busted. Um, we wound up being acquired by HP that didn't go very well. And, uh, Oracle was looking for a team of, uh, distributed systems and middleware engineers to start to build out their own app server platform. So I wound up at, um, taking a job at Oracle and, and thought wow. it would be you know, a couple of years and it wound up, as you say, I've been, it's been about 12 years in total, I think wow. nine and a half the first go around and, uh, um, uh, almost three now in the, my second. Yeah. Season. You, you had a bit of a break from Oracle for some time. What happened there? Yeah, I think we had gotten, it, when, when I joined Oracle the first time, um, there were about 200 people in the middleware division. And by the time I left, it was probably between four and 5,000. Wow. Um, we really kind of built that business up both organically and then um, incrementally by acquisition um, and eventually kind of consolidated that whole uh, Java middleware space between the uh, BEA acquisition and then some microsystems with Java itself. Um, and we kind of, Sorry, we got to, what is middleware? Oh, middleware. Um, middleware is kind of your connectivity software, um, that sits between the application logic and your backend systems and databases. Mm-hmm. So app mm-hmm. servers or messaging systems, um, Kafka, you know, in some sense, Kubernetes is now playing the, the role of, of, uh, middleware in a lot of systems. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the heavyweight app servers have become largely displaced. And people are moving more toward containerized applications. Mm-hmm. Uh, but during, back in the day, that was that for app development, modern app development, uh, you know, it was the Java Enterprise Edition app server environment was kind of the, the normative standard. And then that started to get displaced by the open source uh, Spring framework. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and then I think Spring, while it's still around, you know, people have gotten much more free form in the technologies they're using for app application implementations. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, it was, I mean, it was great, great journey, very interesting. Uh, you know, we really got to develop the, the market and the business. Um, uh, but we got to a phase where, uh, this was probably around 2011, late 2010, where Oracle was really focused on ingesting and integrating all the acquisitions they had done and kind of consolidating their platform around the app portfolio, which is important work for the business, but I'm kind of a hardcore technologist at heart. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was getting more and more interested in the, the emerging big data segment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, so it was clear that, uh, at the time to really go out and work, um, with Hadoop and HBase and a bunch of the technologies that were coming together, um, in, in that whole uh, ecosystem that, that, uh, that was really going to happen outside the company. Um, mm-hmm. so I wound up getting hooked up with, uh, the team that was spinning out of Yahoo that had built Hadoop from day one. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, building out the one of the two pure plays in the market around the big data, mm-hmm. in, in specific to the Hadoop ecosystem, and mm-hmm. so they 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 you know we went on a tear there. That that company IPO'd remarkably fast. I think from inception to IPO it was probably three and a half years. Wow, uh, and um, 
things were going quite well until I'd say 2016. And there was a pretty dramatic shift. Uh, it just, it, it, the thing about Hadoop is it opened up, it was an important evolutionary technology. It opened up a lot of new use cases um, for non-specialists, really, you know, say your typical enterprise business to start to deal with both multi-structured data and very, very large data sets in ways that they couldn't before, right? Mm -hmm. Economically couldn't or because the technologies really didn't cater to the kind of use mm -hmm. cases that uh, Hadoop opened up. The problem with Hadoop was this big monolithic system um, that was hard to stabilize, hard to run, um, and just expensive. You know, the open source bits um, were, were really the least uh, expensive part of the equation because you had to kind of rack and stack all these machines, put them in your data centers or in colo, um, pay for power all the time. And um, by 2016, I think people got uh, comfortable enough with the public cloud infrastructure, they began to take the same data sets and just put them into object storage. But in that case, you, do, you, you basically shift the whole operational problem um, off to the cloud vendor and you're only really paying for what you use. Um, the, the object storage you know, is pretty cheap. So what is object storage? Uh, something like S3 and Amazon, you know, mm. but every cloud platform uh, has has some variant. We just call ours the object storage cloud service. Mm -hmm. So at, at uh, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, um, Azure has had a couple different uh, permutations in their environment, but the latest uh, they're calling it Azure Data Lake Storage. Mm. Um, but every cloud platform has this ability to take, uh, you know, binary objects and just put them into uh, okay. And so they're not, uh, whether S3 or Amazon Azure, they don't use Hadoop in the back end. Uh, you can. I mean, it's one option, right? So if you put the, the data into uh, object storage, you can spin up a Hadoop cluster, pull it from object storage, process it, shut the cluster down. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a very heavyweight infrastructure to do that. The approach we've mm -hmm. taken, one of the things when I came into Oracle is, like I say, I really saw a lot of value in this space for end users. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, the technology just seemed really too uh, cumbersome and difficult mm -hmm. to use. So what I wanted to really do was kind of step back and say, how do we maintain and preserve all the good parts of this ecosystem, but eliminate the overhead, eliminate the cumbersome nature of it and the unwieldy mm -hmm. nature of it? Um, so we've taken a very different approach. If you, We have a, a cloud service called Dataflow, mm -hmm. and it uses... Apache Spark um, to do the data processing, which is kind of the dominant um, data crunching framework in that whole Apache Hadoop ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, but it's entirely clusterless. It's not just serverless, it's clusterless. Um, we pre-allocate a bunch of resources in the back end, and all you have to do as a user is say, okay, I want to run this job, I want to use this much processing power, and I want to touch this data. Uh, and then within seconds or tens of seconds, um, we're off. Mm -hmm. uh, processing arbitrary workloads. But the beauty of it is you've, not only at the storage layer, do you have nothing to maintain or deal with as a end user from an operational perspective, but even at the data processing level, um, it's about as close as you're gonna get to a zero ops model. Mm -hmm. the, the difference with Hadoop, you could do the same workload with Hadoop over object store, but to spin up a Hadoop cluster, it probably takes you know five, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, like I say, it's, it's a lot of overhead. Um, and you really don't get any real benefits uh, beyond what what uh, mm. you can really process with the the actual Spark packages. Mm -hmm. um, so we tried to take a look at this as kind of a Gen two approach to learn from um, what other people have done, both good and bad, and and uh, scrap the bad part. So I'm pretty excited about this. I look at this as kind of big data done right, and mm -hmm. uh, really Oracle kind of being the first vendor. Um, to go out and not just utilize the open source technology as it was designed for the on-premise data center, but to really re-envision it for um, you know cloud native use cases that are actually tractable um, for for like real businesses, enterprise businesses. They're not. Um, you go to your typical, say it's steel manufacturing or um, insurance company and so forth. Um, you'll have specialists, right? You'll have people, for example, in insurance that are good for data science because they come in with strong statistical backgrounds. Um, but you're not going to get the same kind of population of technology technologists that you would have at like an eBay or a PayPal or, you know, back end for Apple, where people are doing lots of data management and data crunching with a staff that's specialized in distributed systems, experts in open source, 
you know, fully resourced to, to keep this machinery running. Hmm. So I think, I think that the goal is to, to not really lose anything in terms of the capabilities that those companies can bring to bear on the problems they're trying to address, but at the same time, make it tractable for, you know, pretty much universal population. Hmm. Gotcha. Wow. Thank you for that description. I remember in uh, 2000, like uh, between 2012 and 14 or 15, I was working at some point with uh, a company that was about to invest in the magnitude of tens of millions of dollars to spin up a Hadoop on-premise cluster. And that's when Hadoop was kind of big and cloud was only getting bigger, only becoming popular. And they were like, should we go to the cloud? Should we do Hadoop uh, on-premise? Um, are you, like, from what you just uh, described, I gather that the age of Hadoop has gone. Like, it's had its rise, it had its fall, and now now we're moving to something post-Hadoop. Yeah, I, I think that, um, like I say, it was evolutionary technology. I think it was important. Um, but I think that... Um, and I'll be honest with you, the rise of the cloud, cloud-based data lakes, um, I didn't see it happening in 2014. You know, mm -hmm. If you go back to 2014, Hadoop was kind of in its heyday. Um, I think we IPO'd in 2014, actually. So that was kind of an exciting year. Uh, Good timing. Uh, but, um, you know, the cloud platforms at that point were seen as less stable and less secure. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there were a lot of there was a lot of skepticism that people were going to be able to take mission critical data sets and just have them live in the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, I think by 2016, things had flipped over. There was a lot of hardening, a lot of maturation, and, P and the cloud platforms were starting to become uh, the de facto uh, data lake infrastructure of choice. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's only continued to, to strengthen itself. So. I think yeah, the the days of Hadoop are effectively over. But there's still look, there's still organizations um, that, for one reason or another, um, are not able or ready to make that transition into the cloud yet. And from an on-premise um, scale out, uh, multi-structured data management perspective, there aren't really good alternatives uh, mm -hmm. to Hadoop. So there's there's still a market um, there, and I think there will be for the foreseeable future. Um, but you know, our, our mantra at the time was 50% of the world's data and Hadoop in 10 years. And, uh, um, I think 50% of the world's data will wind up in, in the cloud, not, not in Hadoop. Probably, so, probably. But again, if all these take... learnings and the stuff that happened there, they were super important. I mean, they really helped uh, oh, of course. open up a tremendous amount of value for not just the tech industry, but I think for, for all industries. And that was one of the interesting things with the big data landscape, we speculated at the time that there were certain industries that would be um, very heavily investing in big data and a lot of industries that wouldn't actually wasn't the case, you know, retail, healthcare, finance, manufacturing. Um, I mean, we had a, a really strong presence across um, just about every vertical. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, very important uh, technology. We learned a lot from but um, now, now we're we're moving uh, we're moving into a world really where there, there there is a platform in the sense that you've got to manage your data and be able to access it, um, keep it secure, govern it. But the frameworks and tools that you apply over top of that data set highly variable, right? And within an organization, and the great thing about the cloud infrastructure is it doesn't really constrain you. You can run whatever you want uh, and, and have it access the data in the object store. Um, so we, you know, for example, we did the serverless Spark infrastructure. It's one way to access the data, but it's not the only way. You can bring in your own frameworks. Um, you could spin up a neural network and grab GPUs, crunch the data um, through a whole bunch of training exercises, release the GPUs when you're done the training, and you know, maybe a month later, you're you're doing you're doing something different. Um, so there's, you know, the, the, there's almost this infinite uh, flexibility that the cloud opens up in terms of the tools that you can bring to bear to the problem domain. And as you know, with a, especially with machine learning, a lot of lot of evolution in the tool set, right? A lot, lot of advances in the algorithms. Yeah, uh, and that'll continue at pace. Mm. And, and it also helps smaller companies get started faster, right? Because a lot of startups which are crunching huge uh, data sets and are also IPOing 
not because they have a huge team or lots of money to spend on servers. No, because they can use Amazon servers yep. or your or your Not servers. Or OCI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, no, that's that's absolutely the case. Uh, and like you know, the, the, like I say, with the Hadoop, was interesting patterns were developing. People wanted to start doing more with uh, machine learning and start to do more with, say, TensorFlow. The problem was, you know, Hadoop ass- assumed that storage and compute were kind of conjoined. They were mm-hmm. having together. So we had, at the time, seen organizations that were going and they were buying NVIDIA appliances and they're sitting next to their Hadoop cluster and copying a bunch of data out of the Hadoop cluster in this NVIDIA thing. And uh, that, this is expensive and kind of unwieldy architectures to do what be- was becoming more and more fundamental work. As I say now, you know, you're on the cloud. I can spin up, uh, you know, a neural network over top of, uh, uh, you know, set of GPUs, process the data. I don't pre-spend anything, right? I spend mm-hmm. for what I use. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of flexibility. I think the economics tend to be much better if they're done in a controlled way. The, mm-hmm. I mean, the flip side to it is, if you get into the cloud and you're not careful about managing the compute availability to you know, consumption for when you're using it, but releasing it and then releasing it, you can drive some pretty substantial bills. So yeah, yeah. A, you gotta be careful. There's a, it, almost shifts the problem in terms of op- operations from keeping infrastructure running to managing the financial, uh, yeah. to the organization, which is healthy. I mean, that's the way it should be. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think the that's same true. thing now with a lot of data science, is you get more and more teams uh, looking closely at the business problem as opposed to the algorithm problem, uh, you know, in, a, in say a typical enterprise organization. So there's a, these convergent trends are really more and more toward uh, meeting the goals of the business versus trying to you know wrestle mm-hmm. with the technology, which is where we want things to be heading toward. Those are two very valuable insights. Thank you for that. So that Hadoop, one of Hadoop's problem was was uh, they or it assumed that storage and compute are together. By separating those out, we have now cloud platforms which are much more efficient. And in addition, using cloud platforms allows uh, the objectives of this um, data science machine learning to be aligned with the objectives of the business financially. Well, yeah. So I think the, the cloud element helps quite a bit um, on the data science side. I think the other thing is um, the state of the tool set available to data scientists has changed quite a bit. Mm-hmm. If I go back four years ago, you didn't have things like ubiquitous auto ML, right? Mm-hmm. So if I'm a data scientist four years ago, even if I'm using a pre-implemented uh, algorithm, I still have to kind of bring a lot more art is a sort of this dark art of trying to do feature engineering, um, algorithm selection, you know, hyperparameter tuning. And, you know, if you look at where things have progressed with the availability of these auto ML capabilities, you know, the, the, the machinery and the tools around the data science toolkit can do a reasonably good job, in many cases, as good a job as humans uh, to actually, actually get you to production of a good model, right? Mm -hmm. So then what does it mean for me as a data scientist? It means as a data scientist, I spend less time trying to do a lot of tweaking and tuning and kind of instinctual Mm -hmm. uh, adaptation of the of the um, tools and libraries and more focus on the actual data, understanding the data, understanding the the business problem, and, uh, you know, moving more and more into the um, the business domain in terms of getting uh, a focus on better results. Hmm. And that, that, that to me has been a big sea change uh, for sure. Hmm. And we've been, in, I mean, just again, not to, to make this vendor specific per se, but um, one, of the, one of the great things about Oracle is after we, we did the Sun acquisition, we got a large research organization. And so Oracle Labs, one of their main pillars of focus is machine learning. And uh, we work really closely with the labs group around uh, AutoML toolkit. Um, which we think is getting, you know, pretty much better results than, than what you can get into the in the public domain. But we package it together with open source uh, technologies and make it a part of a collaborative platform. Um, so if you come into Oracle Cloud, you have a platform for data scientists to work together as teams 
Um, but just built into it for free for all intents and purposes. Um, you have all these auto ML capabilities, uh, just, uh, just as a, a default part of the Python toolkit we provide. Wow. Fantastic. Uh, just before the podcast, uh, your PR director, Victoria, told me about the new division that you're heading in data science and AI. Is, is that what we're talking about now? Or is that something else? Yeah, we, we've started a um, fairly substantial uh, investment. Uh, well, actually, Oracle has a lot of investment in machine learning overall. Mm -hmm. right? It goes from labs um, all the way up through the apps. You know, there's mm -hmm. a whole division of our applications uh, organization that is basically just developing um, models for um, domain problems specific to mm -hmm. the you know, the application. So if you're doing um, HCM, you know, HR type applications, um, we'll do resume matching, right? Mm -hmm. um, or supply chain optimizations, all kinds of, um, you know, problems. So products, with, effectively. Yeah, we deliver, so, you know, you consume the benefits of mm -hmm. the machine learning models, but you don't have to go build them yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's always, I think that's, Clearly, where we're going to see the most uptake of machine learning from end users. Uh, at the end of the day, it's the same thing. Like you, you pick up your phone and you, you've got you know image recognition of the phone and all that. You know you've got mm -hmm. billions of people now using machine learning models, but they don't even know it, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, at the same time, um, on the cloud team, we've started up uh, a fairly significant investment around both data scientists. Uh, enablement within the cloud infrastructure, so kind of adjacent to the big data space, adjacent to the data warehousing space, mm. um, and that's that's really derivative of an acquisition that we did about two years ago, DataScience.com. So we brought in this platform that allows you to take, you know, standard notebooks, standard Python libraries, um, stand them up and make them a valid team, but it 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 puts an overlay or wrapper around it that ties it into source code control helps you do easy model deployment. Um, you know, you, you get a manager or a uh, uh, administrator. What, for the project. what does that mean for data scientists? Well, you know, so, so what, one of the things we saw a lot with data scientists is that they, they love open source. There's a lot out there for free. It's all great. Um, and so they would grab it, they put it on their laptop, they go grab some data and they'd start mucking around and, and mm -hmm. building models and then pop out something. And it's like, well, you know, three months later, now we got a great model. What were the data sets used? You know, mm -hmm. what, how, how did you get here, right? Like, what was the history? Um, you know, can I reproduce it? We want to, in some ways, bring the more mature practices that you would see in software development and apply them in, I'd say, non-intrusive ways <laughs> to the data scientist. Um, so if you come into our environment, you'll start up a session, you know, work in a notebook, it'll be all the tools and libraries data scientists are familiar with, but you're really open source, open source. Yeah, for sure. Mm, that's we, really cool. Yeah, we provide, I mean, we do provide additional libraries. We have this accelerated uh, data science toolkit, which is kind of mm -hmm. Python add-ons makes it easy to connect to the cloud resources. Mm -hmm. So if I want to do something like access uh, data in, in a cloud-based data lake, or if I mm -hmm. want to spin up GPUs um, to, you know, to run uh, algorithms more efficiently. Right, it's just th those kinds of convenience tools are there. We have the auto ML capabilities um, that I talked about before, and then we also have um, a bunch of uh, capabilities for uh, model explainability. So it's a fairly and in, in some visualization as well. So we we do add in and augment with IP that we've developed, but there's nothing that constrains you to use that. You can work with the open source tools. Um, the, I think the real benefit for teams is that now there's a single environment. You can share um, notebooks. You can publish models into a model catalog. Mm -hmm. So you start to bring all this governance and control and source code management um, into an environment. So as a data scientist, you don't really lose anything. You kind of have mm -hmm. everything you like and you're familiar with. But at the same time, if you're running a data science project, now you've got uh, mm -hmm. a little bit more accountability and um, uh, and uh, I think much better collaboration and consistency. Mm. Well, what would you say to the comment which I've heard in various forms previously quite a few times that Oracle is more suited for large organizations that have a large budget or enterprise level companies? Um, is Oracle does Oracle is Oracle suitable or beneficial? And all these this, some of the things you're talking about are amazing. Like you know, I don't have to have GitHub separated to my Jupyter notebooks, to my, you know, where I'm storing the data, all of that is integrated. 
that would be really cool. But what if I'm a small organization, a startup type of level? Do can I also get the benefit of these tools? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. I mean, so first of all, if you look at Oracle historically, um, that's that's substantially true. Right? The statement you made is pretty accurate. Um, the cloud business, you know, we built it from scratch, de novo, and we did it with the intention of providing a hyperscale cloud that is, you know, as accessible as an Amazon or an Azure or Google, right? Um, and that was kind of the the assumption from day one. So if you want to come in, you know, as a developer, there's a free tier, you can get started, doesn't cost you anything. You know, if you're a small organization, it's it's really easy to get bootstrapped. You can, you can, you can onboard with a credit card uh, and uh, and start to work in the environment. So there's there is there is a certain sense in which um, you know the the historical on-premise portfolio really was targeted more at the the enterprise level, kind of a step above the SMB segment. Um, I don't think that's true for the cloud. Uh, in the cloud, you know, clearly, clearly we want to be the best at the enterprise game mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. that's really not the strengths of the other players in the cloud market. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, you never get there with the enterprise unless you win the hearts and minds of developers uh, mm-hmm. and really your average user. And what you'll see now is with the cloud capabilities, our customer profile has shifted quite a bit. Um, so there's a lot of customers that were never going to be, you know, large Oracle customers or even small Oracle customers, uh, which have which have been onboarding uh, into into OCI. Lots of startups um, just mm-hmm. taking advantage of the machinery, taking advantage of the services. Mm-hmm. A couple of reasons: one, um, we again, even with the cloud overall, we had this advantage of what we call a Gen two uh, approach. So we had the we we brought in a lot of architects and implementers that had worked on other hyperscale clouds. And the the traction for coming into work on OCI was you get a chance to to solve the problems that you realized you couldn't solve because you had engineered your way uh, into a corner. So it was a kind of a clean room environment uh, with where where a lot of the engineers had an opportunity to learn from the mistakes of the first generation and just do mm-hmm. a better job. Um, so we wound up with with both a more efficient environment, especially strong at the network level. Uh, but also it's, uh, you know, pricing wise, I think it's, it's more attractive than the competitors again, because we have the ability to, to do a, a more streamlined, uh, implementation really at the base IAS level. So that's, yeah. that's been uh, a real boon for us in terms of just attracting a kind of a new, uh, set of users into the cloud. And it's not, it's not just startups or not just small businesses. I mean, it, it's also individuals and, and developers, students. Um, much different than what you would have seen uh, certainly five years ago in terms of the customer um, spread that uh, was typical for Oracle. The other thing that's that I will say, this is true that um, in terms of the SMB segment, not just at OCI, you know, not, not just on our, our you know, cloud. OCI is uh, Oracle Cloud Infra. Oracle Infra- Cloud Infrastructure, yeah. So that's really that's our, the same our, as our, our OCP. Um, oh. Oracle Cloud Platform. We've a whole bunch of rebranding. Um, okay. So the, the standard unified uh, term that we use now is OCI. Gotcha. Uh, gotcha. All cloud services, native, um, done, you know, done right, and the Gen yep. two approach. The I will say though, we've also picked up quite a few SMB customers, you know, small businesses, medium sized businesses, um, just in our SaaS portfolio as well. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. partially because that was a sweet spot for NetSuite, which is now a part of Oracle, but even, um, you know, in the more conventional, um, segments for Oracle applications on the SaaS side, um, you know, quite a few startups, um, quite a, quite a few younger companies have gone with Oracle, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, competition with Workday and others. That's great. So SA- by SaaS, you mean the applications you mentioned, like for instance, resume matching, the, those type of things, like ready products. Yeah, your HR apps, you know, yeah. your all all that uh, could be financials, could be um, you know supply chain management. Okay. Okay. Very very interesting. Um, you actually answered my next question, which was about the differences with Amazon and Azure. Sounds like uh, you've uh, been able because you're building it from scratch and uh, yeah, later. So- I think I think it, there's, there's two fundamental differences in my view. Um, one is uh, at the low, we might say at the, at the base infrastructure at the IaaS layer, um, we've had a chance to really do this clean room Gen two implementation. 
Um, and if you start looking at benchmarks, you look at price performance, um, you know, we, we, and in fact, there's a new price calculator that's up on Oracle's website. I mean, mm-hmm. you, the, the different, the differences are dramatic, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's been a, a big draw, um, it, not just for smaller businesses, but large businesses that are getting these huge bills from Amazon, they, you know, you come in, you can do your cost, cal- cost calculation in some cases, save tens of millions of dollars. That's where you'll see like companies like Zoom or uh, others that are doing video conferencing or moving over to OCI um, because they're getting better, much better, uh, you know, cost performance uh, outcomes on the one hand. On the other hand, what what those vendors are lacking and one of the core strengths of Oracle is, of course, always been this enterprise play, you know, enterprise um, readiness at the cloud infrastructure level. Right, mm-hmm. from a security perspective, from a governance perspective, um, from an accountability perspective, but you marry that together with the apps and you really have a complete environment to run the entirety of the business. Mm-hmm. And today, you know, to a large extent, Amazon and Azure are just missing, they don't have those core uh, capabilities uh, moving up into that SaaS or apps tier. Um, mm-hmm. So Oracle really does, I think, have the first cloud that would be fair to classify as, a, as an enterprise cloud all mm-hmm. in. Okay, very very interesting. Um, do you think are they catching up, Amazon and Azure? Um, well, I th- you know, I th- who knows what's going to happen with acquisitions? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> software industry it is organic development in this space is hard, right? To build yeah. out an apps portfolio, you're talking about uh, you know, in, in the mature apps vendor cases, you're talking about you know decades of investment, and even in the quote unquote you know. Uh, startups that have come in from a SaaS perspective, so you know Workday, Salesforce, they're no longer young companies. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yeah. so, so it's it's a big investment over a long period of time, uh, and I, I doubt that uh, organic investments going to uh, fill those gaps for some of the other competitors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um, we talk a bit about trends, and we talk about big data, kind of like. Uh, or Hadoop, for that matter, having its rise and fall, cloud picking up, uh, Gen 2 cloud. We talked about uh, data science that with AutoML, data science is probably going to become more of a soft skill type of uh, profession where you need to do like get the business knowledge and uh, understand what the questions are and how to communicate them. What other trends are you seeing in the space of data science or data management? Yeah, so that's a good question. That's a great question. Um, one is the number of data scientists, functional data scientists, um, has just exploded, right? Um, and that that's great, right? Because it means there. When I'm going to go back to say we talked about the 2014, um, we used to talk about data scientists being unicorns. Yeah, you know, it's like the best you could do is go into university and hire somebody with a PhD or master's in statistics, you know, and 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 hope to sort of train them up. Um, it, you know, the tool sets weren't really there. So you kind of had this really wonky problem and um, that's changed quite a bit. I mean, the, the, the tools that are available have gotten a lot more sophisticated and then just the number of people that are capable of doing meaningful work has exploded. Yeah. Um, and that that for us, especially as a vendor is, is great because it means we can bring more and more people into the platform, do more and more useful workloads. The other thing is NLP. Um, I one of my their leads for our uh, the accelerated data science uh, toolkit I mentioned. He likes to say that um, text is now as fundamental for businesses uh, as ins and floats were, you know, just <laughs> twenty years ago. And uh, it's, it's something. You know, there's a lot of it would be continued innovation, but um, you know, the results that we're seeing um, in terms of text summarization. Um, topic modeling, et cetera. I mean, they're infinitely better um, than they were a few years ago. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with BERT and other um, you know, techniques, and uh, we expect to see that continue to accelerate um, in ways that I think our businesses haven't even yet started to tap into. I mean, mm-hmm. think about all the information, contracts, emails, um, you know, documents, Word documents. Phone calls. It's just everything is sitting there waiting to be mined. And I always like to say like the, the real promise here about from a, <clears throat> from a anal- an analytics perspective for machine learning is that you can start to answer the questions you didn't even know you were going to be able to yeah. ask. Right. And I think that that's, 
that's been a, a sea change over the last couple of years. Um, and we're doing like, for example, I'm at one of my groups in the cognitive services side equation, heavily focused on text analytics. Um, and we'll be looking at applying that both in inside of our own applications more and more aggressively, but also just opening it up um, to end users to use um, directly. Very interesting. What, why would you say that we are seeing a rise of NLP? Uh, you know, I think it's just a convergence uh, of enough investment, enough innovation, and enough uh, hardware-based acceleration that mm -hmm. it's almost like a perfect storm event. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that's, one, that's a big one. Um, the other thing, as I say, like it, people are comfortable working with terabytes, petabytes of data. You know, again, that was hard before. Um, so I think this big data thing continues to be important, um, but it's just not constrained by a technology footprint that was hard to utilize or stand up. That's that's certainly, um, you know, part of the cloud trend that's kind of enabling these use cases to unfold. Um, trying to think the, um, the, the, the other thing about this is, um, we are seeing more and more um, bleed over into sort of the conventional BI analytics side of the equation where you've got people who were looking at business problems, but largely data warehouses, largely SQL oriented that are starting to also pull in and, and uh, mind meld with data science groups. Um, so that's again, pulling um, the core ML capabilities closer into the lines of business in useful ways. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's it's. I mean, it's a fantastic time to be working in this space right now. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm really glad you mentioned this uh, business intelligence merging with data science or getting closer because, yeah, like a lot of time, it depends on your definition. People say data science and they actually mean dashboards or they mean Tableau and Power BI and and those tools. Yeah, that's that's right. So that, that's that's a bit of confusion that's going on as well. On the one hand, on the other hand, um, that community is starting to draw from the work of data scientists mm -hmm. more and more. So you will see, you know, ML powered dashboards uh, yeah. for sure. One of the things you know, Oracle's got a large analytics business, the Oracle mm -hmm. Analytics Cloud. Um, on our data science service, you can publish models into a model catalog. You can browse and consume those models from within the analytics tools so you can start to build you know predictive analytics directly into your 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 dashboarding and reports uh, in ways that uh, with more sophisticated models than you would typically be able to do uh, even just a year ago so there, there's there's a kind of it's not so much a convergence as think about a Venn diagram and mm -hmm. you see an area of overlap an area of synergy mm -hmm. uh, but I, I on the same on the same time I don't see um, you know the the, the world of uh, Tableau specialists suddenly becoming data scientists uh, mm -hmm. overnight either. Um, mm -hmm. I think you just see the sort of intersection points. I should mention, we talked a lot about big data, um, but also getting really good at building good models with small sets of data. You know, mm -hmm. there's more sophistication in transfer learning. Um, so, so, you know, while, while, while big data has played a role in terms of um, acceleration of quality of models, um, we're seeing more and more the case that you can do um, progressively good models for your own specific problem domain um, with relatively small data sets, which are often, you know, if you're, if you're taking, for example, let's say you're trying to deal with a problem um, that is specific to an application that you've developed in-house and you're collecting some data and that you've got accessible within, um, uh, you know, an operational database under the app. It may not be tons of data there, right? But if you can start to apply, uh, you know, transfer learning techniques, you can often exploit the smaller data sets in conjunction with work that's already been done um, in terms of, uh, you know, initial seed training and get good results as well. So I think you're going to see uh, more attention paid to how to get more effective models um, for specific problems with less and less data as well. Mm -hmm. so I think that's going to be another area that's going to be uh, hugely beneficial overall from an enterprise perspective. Very interesting. Um, 
So a lot of these things that uh, we talked about, like again, going back to the question of enterprise versus a smaller business, uh, quite clear. And, and I even see now that as a small business, I could come onto Oracle and benefit from like a lot of these um, features, especially like the Gen two type of cloud. Question is, apart from the pro the compute side of things. Uh, if I have all these free tools available to me, if I can, if I can technically do the things on my laptop, um, and I can get version control through free software like GitHub and things, or like uh, tools like GitHub, w why would I choose Oracle and stick uh, with Oracle, like uh, as opposed to not choosing anything and just going with every all the open source tools all the time? Yeah, I I don't think it's a it's an either or, right? Mm -hmm. you, you want a platform, you want a hub in a sense, right? You can bring the work together and you wanna make sure you've got the resources that you need to actually do training effectively. And that changes over time. So if you're trying to roll your own, you're sort of st you're stuck in this static snapshot. Okay, good, sure. um, versus you come into a cloud platform, you can use all the open source stuff, um, but you're not constrained right, in the same way. You can continue to evolve. You can evolve from a hardware perspective. You can evolve from a software perspective. As I say, we, we try, like when we take, for example, on the data science side of the equation, um, when we develop the data science service, the idea was make sure that you're not taking anything away from data scientists. Mm -hmm. You know, use the, like foundationally, open source is, is the center of the model. Um, and just make sure that it works well so that you can do a well-managed uh, team collaborative set of projects. On the one hand, that you can share those models and outputs with other parts of the business easily. Um, and then you can continue to just begin to, uh, to leverage and uptake um, every new wave of hardware, every new wave of software as it becomes available. Uh, mm -hmm. So for us, it's really just, it's a hub to facilitate those things rather than a competition with them. Fantastic, I, and I love that because I I uh, worked a bit with, uh, I don't know if they're still around, there's a provider called of Hadoop uh, Greenplum and uh, they acquired Pivotal, which was like, a, I think a consulting firm. And, in order to work with their instance of R on Greenplum Hadoop, you had to learn not R but Pivotal R, and yeah, it was like yeah. it's like, at the data warehouse, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's well, great that, that you know, look all these all these data warehouses do have um, legitimate need to include um, libraries and capabilities for um, algorithm for for exploiting algorithms directly on the data. I mean, you you have. You have data in a data warehouse, there's a time and a place for that, and all the major data warehousing vendors provide that. Um, but I don't think that's also you know the general purpose data science um, problem. Mm -hmm. I think that's a that's a specialized um, problem specific to uh, you know the data warehousing domain. Gotcha. Okay, understood. Um, so we're talking about uh, a bit about existing trends and you know things that are uh, becoming hot or important, uh, picking up traction. How do you see the future? Like if we took a snapshot of the future in three years from now, not too far, but not too close. Three years from now, what will the future of um, data management look like? Um, well, okay, so let me go out a little further. <laughs> sure. Because uh, I think present trends are gonna persist in the near term. And, I, and like I say, I think we're really focused on is um, driving people more and more toward a zero ops model what is zero ops? We're, we're not managing infrastructure. Right? Oh. So we want people to basically say, I've got data. I'm going to be able to put the data under management and I'm going to be able to process it um, mm -hmm. with the focus being on problem solving, not on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. right? And I think you're going to see that um, be one of our main focuses. Same thing with our uh, data warehousing, right? our autonomous data warehouse. The idea here is that the data warehouse um, is actually being run um, by machine learning models, by and large. Mm. So things that DBAs used to do, um, you know, index management, um, tuning and so forth, the data warehouse is just getting better and better at doing that itself. Just, just to clarify, so data warehousing is the storage, data ops is the processing. Yeah, well, I think data, data warehousing is, you know, today when you have a data warehouse, you start up a database, right? Mm -hmm. So you typically scale out multi-node data, uh, database. Um, you know, you, the ops around the database or most organizations, a combination of IT and DBAs, 
we want to drive as much of that mm. overhead down to zero, right? So okay, if you're putting you. data in a relational data warehouse, um, we want to make your focus be how do you get the most out of your data, uh, not how do you invest the most on IT and, and running databases and tuning databases. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to these big data workloads, same idea. You know, put your data in the object store. Um, this the things like data flow with a serverless implementation mm-hmm. lets you get the value out of the data without having to run a bunch of machinery and maintain a bunch of the big IT staff to keep the mm-hmm. um, you know keep a bunch of clusters going. So I, okay. I think that will continue um, over the next three to five years to be the major trend in the industry. I think mm-hmm. it, the workload's got a, a big head start on both those dimensions. Uh, I think you'll see others start to follow suit over time. The thing that if I, if uh, the reason I said, let's look out lar- longer than that, I think ultimately where we want to be is to think about the cloud um, as your database, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So you don't think about individual technologies for storing the data. Um, you And you, ultimately you don't think about individual technologies for processing the data. You just push your data to the cloud, how and where it gets um, stored behind the cloud interface is a entirely vendor problem, right? And then you will more and more want to be able to just ask questions about your data without having to, uh, you know, project into technologies that um, are very specific to data problem, the, the data processing. So you can imagine where I can come in and uh, I can I can speak to my computer, which is hooked up to the cloud, say, hey, I want to see how sales forecasts were um, uh, compared to actuals in North America for April, right? And the result comes back almost like when you go into Google and you just type in, you know, type in a search, um, you get back a result and their algorithms in Google are trying to figure out as best they can, um, what are the most relevant results for your need? Um, but you lack precision, right? And you're sort of, um, uh, today, at least, th- th- there's a degree of personalization, but it's not hyper personalized. I think over time you'll be able to get almost the same um, kind of interaction that you have with Google, except you'll be able to ask very specific and very sophisticated um, questions and get very specific and very sophisticated responses back. Your know, response oh. may be a spreadsheet that comes back. Okay, fantastic. But, you know, I didn't have to say; it just knows I work with spreadsheets. Yeah. Here's what it, you know. Here's this is going to be the best that uh, the best um, uh, outcome for you as a as a user, and uh, you're not looking at individual databases. You're not looking at um, you know trying to parse through you know abstruse uh, data structures and so forth. That, that that's the level of sophistication that you're going to get out of the cloud. Um, you know, in in a in another decade or or so, mm-hmm. and I think the thing about that. It goes back also with language processing, right? If you think about speech, you think about um, you know text analytics, uh, just being able to say something, have that interpreted, right? And in some sense, understood, then having the the that uh, translated into optimal set of queries that happen in the back end, and then coming back with an optimal set of results that will largely be um, you know driven through machine learning. Mm-hmm. Well, wow, thank you. That's a, that's a great vision. Uh, I have one more topic that uh, just popped to mind that I wanted to touch on: five G and edge computing. And uh, what I've heard, I'm not an expert in this by any means, but what I've heard is five G is here to partially uh, enable edge computing, and edge computing is uh, computing things right. Like for instance, Siri right now it won't work if you have no internet connection. But that's but if you switch but if we have on device computing then it'll work. Whereas edge computing is somewhere in between. It's between the cloud and it's kind of locally in your area. So uh, is edge computing going to disrupt Oracle's business model? No, I mean I think it it, it the, the in general um, the capabilities of the cloud will progressively look more and more like they're just a part of the natural landscape we work in. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're still going to need to do a lot of core data processing, a lot of core data management at scale mm-hmm. um, within uh, a centralized context, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what what the promise, at least in the near term with edge computing is, is that you can start to um, externalize what you might call auxiliary processing down toward devices. 
And I think 5G, I mean, 5G will be important because it's opening up bandwidth, uh, but it's also going to be processing power at the edge, which is going to be a determinative factor for what we can do uh, over time as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but for sure, I mean, we'll, we'll certainly see uh, quite a bit of um, model execution occurring um, outside of a centralized context. Is Oracle planning on getting becoming part of that edge computing game? Yeah, I mean, you can't, it's unavoidable now, right? It's, it's all it's all part and parcel. Uh, right now, you know, we've got a whole bunch of stuff around digital assistants and chatbots and so forth. Um, those things are the kind of the, maybe first wave of you'll see uh, projected more toward the edge um, app functionality, um, disconnected uh, modes, etc. Those are all going to be things that we'll see, um, you know, moving more and more into the edge. I still think, you know, it's it's not going to be either or. You know, it's this is sort of complementary uh, set of, of developments, which will allow us to do um, things that, frankly, as a matter of just what what were going to be what would have been be impossible today will be doable on the edge, um, but it's unlikely anytime soon that you're going to supplant the need for internal mm -hmm. systems, uh, mm -hmm. centralized systems. I think, uh, you know, 30 years out, uh, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> a different a different uh, question, but in the near term, I, I think that these are yeah. more or less entirely complementary. Okay. Okay. Understood. Um, yeah. So that kind of like uh, wraps up all my questions and we're also running out of time, but I wanted to ask you for like a... Before we wrap up, like a guidance, because a lot of uh, people listening to this are data scientists, aspiring data scientists who uh, want to, you know, progress their careers and learn as much as possible. And personally, I've learned a lot from you today. For me, it was a very insightful conversation to get up to speed with the world of cloud, because normally as a data scientist, you don't think about it that much. You're not up to date with these trends and, and things that are going on. So what was your recommendation or wish what if you could make one wish for people listening to this uh, who are data scientists in terms of their relationship with the cloud and their them being up to date with what's going on in the cloud what would your recommendation be um well i think i think there's there's a lot of advantages to thinking about um the ability to have a hub so that teams can work together so you get more productive because the better outcomes we get the more audibility we get the more control that teams have and traceability in terms of libraries and versions and so forth, uh, the more ubiquitous uh, the outputs from data scientists teams are gonna be in organizations that might otherwise have been a bit conservative about accepting work that was of um, harder to harder to understand provenance. Um, and I, like I say, I think the, the ability to keep up with the demand, the processing demands are gonna be uh, for doing a lot of, um, artificial intelligence work are gonna be impossible unless you progressively are able to uh, take advantage of uh, the latest hardware, right? So if I want the latest generation of GPUs, you know, some organizations will buy them if they're building out large HPC clusters, things like that. But for, for most uh, businesses, it's just not practical. I think that looking at the cloud as an enabling tool and not as a, and it, it shouldn't be looked at as an impediment. It doesn't take anything away. It only makes the job easier to, to get good results uh, from as, as opposed to um, you know being stuck in the in the laptop based world. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say, just in general, um, for data scientists is um, you know don't don't be afraid of getting close to the line of business because mm -hmm. it again the. The, the value of the technology is what's going to drive investment, which is what's going to drive, um, you know, innovation. And so we need to continue to really be uh, driving powerful outcomes, right? And I know as a technologist, uh, it's easy for me to just get excited about technology. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we, we all need this stuff funded. <laughs> so mm -hmm. getting, getting closer and understanding the business, because we've seen I a couple um, examples um, we, we, one of the, one of the areas Oracle's worked with was, uh, in the health system in the UK and they brought a bunch of machine learning, uh, algorithms in from our, um, uh, Oracle machine learning, um, platform and the turnaround there, they applied it to patient outcomes. They applied it to fraud detection. 
Um, and they were saving um, within, I think, within a year with a twenty-person team, something like a billion do- a billion pounds or plus, a billion pounds plus mm. uh, in in uh, in net savings on a year-over-year basis. Right. So wow. if you can show those kind of results uh, for an organization, you get this kind of uh, return on investment that you're just not going to see it through any other mechanisms. Um, that's really going to build up business confidence to continue to invest and continue to uh, really make sure that this this whole ecosystem is uh, becoming more and more the mainstream. Wow, fantastic. Great advice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cloud doesn't take away from your experience, but adds to it. And uh, make sure to keep the business objectives in mind. Um, Greg, on that note, uh, it's been a huge pleasure. And uh, before I let you go, could you please... Uh, help us out where can we follow you get in touch or learn more about uh, google uh, oracle uh, cloud uh, platform or oracle cloud uh, in infrastructure yeah so i i have uh, i guess periodically i don't do as good a job as i should but uh, i'll i'll put up uh, kind of snippets and and uh, updates and news of interest on linkedin so it's probably the easiest place to mm-hmm. quickly follow um, what i'm up to um, when I'm not kind of heads down in terms of uh, our, our development work. Um, at Oracle Cloud, um, just easiest thing to do is just go to go to uh, Oracle Cloud and uh, open up a free account and start to play with it. I think people will be uh, impressed right off the bat. Fantastic, fantastic. And <laughs> one final question. Uh, do you have a book that you can recommend to our listeners? Uh, you know, it depends where you're, it depends where you're at <laughs> in terms of maturity, uh, in, in the industry from a data science perspective. Um, one of the, the books that we've found to be pretty helpful, um, for our customers have been, uh, one of the O'Reilly books, data science from scratch. Um, this is a, it's a, uh, it's a Python oriented book. And I think Python's kind of, you know, ours sort of going down a little bit. Python's been on the upswing. Um, so I think in terms of languages to really try to get uh, a mastery around from a data science perspective, Python's pretty much where it, where it's at for today. You know, mm-hmm. who knows uh, five years ago or five years from now, uh, mm-hmm. if that's be the case. And it, and it really kind of walks you through, um, you know, building out uh, algorithms, understanding how to to really get uh, value from data, you know, in a kind of fundamental way. So, you know, it's, it's a good starting point. Mm-hmm. Great, thank you. Data science from scratch, right? Yep. Gotcha. Data science from scratch, but right. Uh, on that note, thank you very much, Greg, for coming on the show. It's been a huge pleasure, and uh, I personally learned a lot, and I'm sure many, many other people will too as well. Yeah. Thanks for having me.